Hi, this is Steve with Thresher Media Group. Welcome to When You're Ready to Listen. This podcast is dedicated to exploring the truth about God, things you may not have understood, may not have been taught, or quite frankly, had a very hard time believing. And since our entire relationship with God rests on believing, it is important we learn how to separate the truth from the many lies and fictions that abound within the religion of Christianity. So when you're ready to listen, tune in and discover a pathway to freedom, encouragement, life, and hope. A couple of quick reminders. Um, Thresher Media Group is a public charity, and if the Spirit leads you, we would love for you to support this ministry. You can go to our website and click on the donation tab. The second thing, I've published a book entitled Liberating the Book of Revelation, Returning to the Source of the Message. I encourage you to go to Amazon.com, and you can find the book either under the title, Liberating the Book of Revelation, Returning to the Source of the Message, or by my name as the author, Stephen Villanueva. It's available in hardback, paperback, ebook format, and the Audible version was recently released. So let's move on. We are in episode 123. We're in Revelation 14, verse 13, part 2. In our last podcast, we addressed this very odd statement where the Spirit said, Blessed the dead who are now dying in the Lord from now on, so that they may in the future be caused to rest from their labors, for their deeds now follow with them. Given the use of the present tense, we discovered that this is addressing those who are willing to let God put to death all that is in them that is spiritually dead and dying and which stands in opposition to Christ. The idea is that if we are willing to let God put it all to death, then we will have rest. We will know rest, for we will no longer be striving to do things our way, to be good for God, to do it all right. Rather, we rest in what he has done and all that he will do in and through our lives. To understand this further, we also begun to unpack Jesus' statement regarding rest. Come to me, all you who are now feeling weary and have been caused to being heavy laden, and I will in the future give you rest. You are commanded to take my yoke upon you, and you are commanded to learn from me. For I now am gentle and humble in heart, and you will in the future find rest for your souls. For my yoke easy, and my burden is now light. Jesus says that we must come, and come only to him. This requires us to leave behind the me, the one whom we have always trusted with our lives. It requires us to take what he has to offer us, his yoke of control over our lives. We learned that our willingness to be yoked to Jesus, to be controlled by him, is our exercise of faith. It's our act of belief our decision in the now to trust Yahweh. This only occurs when we come to realize that the source matters. The source is everything. For without him, we can do nothing. Then we discussed three ways that we learn. By example, by instruction, and everyone's favorite, by experience. We can learn by the examples of the men and women of faith who have traveled this journey before us. We can learn by instruction as the Spirit instructs our hearts through the Word of God and through His leading. But it seems that most of us learn best by experience, and that usually requires a lot of mistakes, a lot of pain, and a lot of trouble. But rest assured, once we learn through experience, we tend to never forget it. And this brought us to our topic for this podcast, the why of it all. Come to me all who are now feeling weary and have been caused to being heavy laden, and I will in the future give you rest. You are commanded to take my yoke upon you, and you are commanded to learn from me, for I now am gentle and humble in heart, and you will in the future find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is now light. Jesus gives us the reasons why it is a very good idea to be yoked to him, to let him control the direction of our lives, and to let him put his burden on our lives. He says that he is now gentle and humble in heart. 
He promises that his burden is now light and that we will in the future find rest for our souls. What is he really communicating? The fact that he is gentle and humble in heart is meant to assure us that though we must walk through the shadow of the valley of death and die to all that is dead, and though that path feels quite often as if God is mean, cruel, unloving, and dismissive, he is not. Yes, he must do what is needed to lead us to the place of rest, if we are willing. And yes, that will mean the knife, the fire, the cross, and so many other means of putting to death that which is dead. But it all flows from his heart, which is gentle and humble. In other words, he will never force us down this path. He will entice us for sure. But ultimately, it is up to us to decide if we are going to let him cause us to be willing. He knows that unless we die to that which is dead, we will ultimately die in the second death, along with all those who are so proud of all that they have done for him, all in Jesus' name. The burden. Jesus promises that his burden is now light. Now, no matter what you're going through, no matter how difficult the circumstances, the burden that we must drag behind the cords that are connected to the yoke is light. And that is the beauty of grace. All God desires from us is the willingness to let him be our I am. That is the glorious requirement of faith. If we are remotely willing to let him, he will provide to us the willingness to choose to bear his yoke of control. For it now is God who is now working in you, both to now will and to now work for the sake of his good pleasure. We must never forget that grace is all about what he does for us and what he does in and through our lives as a result of our faith, our willingness to let him be our I am. In the future, rest. Jesus promises that if we take upon our lives his yoke of control, if we let him hold the reins and direct our lives, that in the future we will know and experience rest or a peace of mind that is beyond anything we can imagine. This notion of rest speaks of an outcome that addresses all the core needs of our soul, safety, security, stability, being seen or known, and assurance. It speaks of the absence of worry, anxiety, and fear, but it is a future experience because it is the outcome of our willingness to let Jesus be our I am in all things, all the time. It is the outcome of taking step two, where we dig down deep in our soul and choose to become that little child who is innately and wholly dependent upon their heavenly father. Rest is the result of our letting Jesus lead us down the pathway of dying to what is dead, which ironically is the only pathway that is now leading to life. This is the pathway which so few are now finding. It is God's job. The other notable aspect of rest is that it communicates a lack of work or effort. This is the key to understanding the promise. Transformation. Again, all God asks for is our faith. In effect, our willingness to let him cause us to believe that he is our I am. That is an extremely light burden. Since all the work and effort fall on his back, he is Yahweh Makoreshkim, the one who is responsible to make us holy. It is not our job. It's his. Our only job is to let him cause us to be willing to let him do his job. We spend so much of our life stressing out about our failures and our weaknesses and our sins. But the truth is that we have no ability to fix any of it. Sure, the me tells us that he can handle things, that he has it all under control. But the me can't because our flesh is hostile to God. It does not now subject itself to the law of God, for it is now not even able. And those who are now being in the flesh can not now be caused to please God. This is the reason why we need Yahweh Yasha 
to save us from our flesh, to save us from our sin of unbelief, to set us free from the me. This is the reason that we must first let him cause us to be dying to that which is dead. So in the future, in this life, we can rest in him and in his work. Good works. In addition, the codex is clear that it is God who is wholly responsible for our good works. It is his job. After all, the fundamental truth of our faith is that only God is good. Therefore, it reasons then that only he can do good works. This takes us way back to Revelation 4, where the 24 elders would choose to fall down before him and will cast their crowns before the throne. The elders know and fully believe that only God is good. They are fully convinced that they do not even deserve this amazing reward, symbolizing their victory over the world and over the beast. They know that Christ, the victor, always led them in victory. In casting their crowns before him, they acknowledge that he is the one who enabled them and provisioned them for victory. And they were just willing vessels. He was not just the I am, but he is their I am, the Lord God Almighty. The elders hold to the idea that when by faith we let him, Jesus, possess us, He will do the will of the Father that is in heaven, here on earth, in and through our body. That is the design point of true Christianity. It will be his work, and therefore he is the one to get the glory. As King David and the prophet Isaiah declared, I have no good besides you. Yahweh, you will grant us peace, for all we have accomplished is really from you. The truth is that even our desire to obey God comes from the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Without the Spirit's active involvement, our base nature would still desire, nay, demand our disobedience and self-sufficiency. In contrast, everything good, everything of any eternal value comes from God and God alone. That is why if we ask anything in his name, he will do it. He will literally be the one who does the Father's will. He will just use our bodies to accomplish those deeds. Again, that is the design point. And it is for all these good works that he has done in and through the lives of the elders that they lay their crowns before him and worship. Their victory is all due to his mercy and his grace. All that freely comes from his hands into our lives. Remember, grace is a fixed equation. 100% him and 0% us. The book of Haggai makes it clear that every attempt of God's people to be good and do good by the work of their hands is in the eyes of God unclean or blemished. Contrast that with the bondservants of Jesus Christ, the 144,000 who are deemed to be unblemished, for they wash themselves in the blood of the Lamb. When we think we can do good for God in any aspect of our lives, We elevate ourselves to a place and position that only Yahweh holds. We are not the Lord, the Adonai, of our own lives. We are not Yahweh. We are not the I Am, even though we like to feel that we are. Just like Satan, the beast and the false prophet, we are created beings, and we exist for his will and his pleasure. He is the one and only Adonai. El Shaddai, the Lord, our God Almighty. Hence, our life of faith is about trusting ourselves so completely to Yahweh that he is free to live in, possess, and work through our bodies such that when anyone meets us, they will have met Jesus. This is the pattern Jesus set forth when he told Thomas that anyone who has seen him has seen the Father. Anything but Jesus' life and ours doing his good works will produce insufficient deeds. And the deeds that we do for God, no matter how well-intentioned or how impactful, well, they'll be as filthy rags. Once again, both Jude and Revelation targets those within the visible church with a message which separates those who stand only on the goodness of God 
from those who are trying very hard to be good for God. Because we do not bear the responsibility to do good works of service for God, his burden is very light. And his yoke of control, it's very easy. He just wants us to be willing to let him lead and to let him do all that he needs to do to bring glory to his father. Rest and unbelief. In the Codex, the Spirit connects rest and unbelief in an opposing relationship. To the extent that we do not believe that Jesus is our I am in whatever areas of our life, we will not know rest. But we must understand that the danger of unbelief is alarming. It falls under the idea that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. In other words, unbelief is a poison that spreads through our life and touches on everything. It even has the potential, if left unchecked, to kill us in the sense that it might just lead us to the second death. This was the thrust of the Spirit's message in the book of Hebrews, and his message is chilling. Hebrews 4, verses 1 through 12. Therefore, may we be caused to fear if, well, a promise is now caused to remaining to enter his rest. Any one of you may seem to have come short of it. For indeed, we now have good news being preached to us, just as they also. But the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not caused to having been united by faith in those who had been hearing. For we who have been believing now choose to enter that rest, just as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not in the future choose to enter my rest. Although his works were caused to being finished from the foundation of the world, he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, they shall not in the future choose to enter my rest. Therefore, since it now is caused to remain for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news caused to have been preaching to them failed to enter because of unbelief, he again now fixes a certain day. Today, now saying through David after so long a time, just as has been caused to be said before, today, if you may hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. So there is now cause to remain a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has been entering his rest has himself also desisted from his own works as God did from his. Therefore, may we be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone may fall after the same example of unbelief. God provided the example when he completed his works of creation. He rested for his works were complete. And since the new creation has been imparted into our being, the little sanctuary or holy place of the Spirit of God, He wants us, without exception, to cease from all our works of trying to be good for God and simply rest, confidently knowing that all else is up to Him. All He ever has needed from us is our willingness. Everything else has always been up to Him. In His agape love, He has never been one to force His will on the personal sovereignty which He gave us. Thus, it's always been up to us to be willing to let him help us believe that he is the Lord, our God Almighty, our I Am. After all, if only God is good, then only he can do the good works of the Father. It's all up to him. Any other work is mere garbage and entirely worthless, notwithstanding our good and sincere intentions. The truth is that when we are busy trying to please God, trying to be good, trying to stop sinning, trying to do things right, trying to be a good witness, trying to serve God and with our whole heart, trying to love God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and trying to love the brethren, we are abiding in unbelief. For we still actively believe that we are the I am, or that we have something, no matter how small, to offer to God. But that is one big, fat, gross 
stinky, selfish, delusional lie. The alarming truth about all this is that if we persist in this unbelief, God will not force his way with us. Rather, he will agree with us and declare that they shall not in the future choose to enter my rest. For the good news that we have heard has not been united with faith. And like the Israelites who died in the wilderness, we too will know the death that comes from death, that which comes from the lack of dying to death. Accompanying deeds. So that they may in the future be caused to rest from their labors, for their deeds now follow with them. Okay, we're tracking with that whole yoke and burden explanation of rest. But then how does that make sense with the part about our labors and deeds? Quite frankly, it seems like double talk, and it is very confusing. Are we supposed to labor and perform deeds or not? Let's sort this one out, keeping in mind our context. The Spirit is addressing how we can escape the trappings of the beast, the trappings of the me, and not be among those who end up worshiping the beast. Such restraint is the perseverance of the holy ones who are now keeping the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus, those who are now dying to what is dead. With that in mind, the word translated as labors is a noun and stems from a root word meaning to chop or to cut. By analogy, it stretches to this idea of weariness or toil from chopping. Thus, one of the main purposes of dying to that which is dead is so that we can rest from all the ridiculous chopping and cutting we have been doing. In other words, all the labor we have put into trying to do it right and to be good for God and for others, because that is what good Christians do, just exhausts us and wears us out. For many, the labor of legalism is so heavy it burns them out. The expectations, judgments, and condemnations from others, all done in Jesus' name, and the same rising up from within themselves, then becomes that tipping point which pushes them over the edge and onto the slippery slope of apostasy. For no matter how hard they chop, no matter how hard they labor, they simply cannot do it right. And those who say they do are just good at lying. This becomes a serious problem because of the way God wired us. Few of us labor because it is the right thing to do. We labor, we chop and cut because we want the rest. We want what God says he has for us. Safety, security, stability, being seen or known, and assurance. Simply said, we want his blessing, and so we try hard to get it. But the Spirit is confirming that the pathway to rest is experienced when we stop all those labors of legalism, all those attempts at earning God's blessing. To better understand what the Spirit is communicating, let's look at the end of the phrase, for their deeds now follow with them. The word translated as deeds is the Greek word ergon, meaning to work or to act. And the word translated as follow means to accompany, and that the work and effort is not to be understood as being behind, but alongside. Okay, thank you for all the clarification, but what in the world does that mean? It means that there is a serious price to pay for walking the path of legalism. It weighs us down with exhaustion, and the effort, the toil is always with us, for the work never stops. We can never be good enough. We can never stop sinning enough. We can never love enough, serve enough, repent enough, witness enough, never, 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 and so on. It is like when you see someone who has had a very hard life, their face tells the story. They look worn and their wrinkles cut deep. The effort they have put into surviving this life accompanies them, and it is undeniable. The church at Ephesus. When Jesus wrote to the seven churches, he mentioned to each one of them that he had known something unique that connects to that church. In other words, nothing is a surprise to him before whose eyes all is laid bare. He knows. When he addressed the church at Ephesus, the church that was criticized for their legalism and resulting lack of agape love, he said, I have known your deeds and labors. Ephesus is the only church in which he used this phrase. 
Paraphrasing, he told them, I have known your work at chopping and cutting, fighting those false apostles. And the most amazing thing is that you have not even become exhausted with the labor. You just keep chopping and chopping and chopping. This was not a badge of honor. This was not a compliment. This was a criticism. Though seemingly well-intentioned, they did what they thought God wanted them to do and not what God wanted them to do. As a result, they had gone apostate in Jesus' name. They literally abandoned their first love, agape. They had abandoned Christ, the one who is agape love, all in an attempt to uphold true Christianity. It is terribly and sadly ironic. Jesus asked them to repent or else. Sadly, history shows that they could not give up their legalism, and they chose the or else. The dead who are dying will rest. To summarize this section, the protection from apostasy and following the path of destruction, the path of the beast whose name is destruction, comes when we learn to rest. This results from our willingness to be dying to that which is dead, to that which will kill us in the second death. This is the patient endurance of the holy ones, forsaking the me and coming to Jesus to let him control our lives. Rest is a certifiable promise from Yahweh, but it is found when we come. We come to Jesus and let him be putting to death the me thereby removing all those blasphemous names that we bear. Take, we take upon ourselves his yoke of control and let go of the iron beam of legalism that has ruled over our lives like a brutal dictator and has left us exhausted and spent from all our labors and deeds. Learn, we're to learn that by example, instruction, and yes, experience, all he seeks from us is our willingness to let him be our I am. The rest is up to him in his timing. For if we are willing, he will be our safety, security, stability, and assurance. The one who sees us and knows us. And if we patiently endure, we will come to know his rest. Let's stop here. And in our next podcast, we'll pick up with probably the most anticipated event ever. And that is the rapture of the church and the judgment of those left behind. This next section will blow your mind as the codex is so clear in tying all the various pieces of text together regarding the rapture into one section that will be crystal clear. I'm glad you tuned in and have been ready to listen. To get a free download of the full written transcript with all the scripture references footnoted, please go to threshermediagroup.com that is t h r e s h e r mediagroup.com this is steve with thresher media group when you're ready to listen tune in <laughs>